Well, good morning, everyone. It's good to, good to have you with us in this third uh, service. God has really uh, blessed my, my heart uh, today with the different uh, testimonies and baptisms and just uh, just meeting people. And so I just want to extend a, a welcome to you. If I haven't met you, uh, my name is Pastor Dave. If this is your first time visiting or or one of the few times that you visited, I just hopefully you felt uh, welcomed uh, here and uh, just uh, uh, thankful. These are always special services at Lakeside uh, when we see followers of Christ uh, take the next step and be baptized as believers. And I trust that today will be a blessing uh, to you as well. If you, if you have your Bible or device, you can turn to uh, Matthew chapter 11. The scripture will be up on the screen in just a second here. Uh, but, but I have a question to ask you. Just kind of, kind of think with me. Um, think of the uh, most uh, memorable invitation that you've ever gotten to an event or, or, or to some kind of, some kind of happening. Like, like you, you couldn't believe you got the invitation and you were so excited about going or, or, uh, or something along uh, that nature. I, I was thinking in my own life way back in 1987, a number of you weren't even uh, born yet then, but in 1987, the company I was working for, the owner of the company, uh, lived in St. Louis, and the night before, I got a call like 6, 7 o'clock in the evening, hey, Dave, would you like to come to the World Series uh, baseball game in St. Louis tomorrow? I've got uh, a couple extra tickets. I'd like to have you come down. They were playing the, the, uh, the Royals, and, and so I got invited to a World Series game. I, I, I had been watching it on TV. I had no idea, and that was exciting. Uh, my, uh, one of my really good friends a couple of years ago invited me to the Masters Golf Tournament uh, with him, and that was uh, always a bucket list for me because my dad and I would, uh, one of my favorable or most memorable events, favorite events with my dad is watching that on TV and just seeing the beauty of the area there, and, and uh, that, was a, that was a crazy story. My friend kind of let me down when we were there. His name's Gary. You can ask him later, but no, it was a good, we had a, we had a great time. I, I got to meet, I got an invitation to meet President Bush uh, when I was pastoring up in Algona and got to shake his hand and, and uh, you know, have a, a short little conversation, maybe 30 seconds. And uh, so, so I, those, those are some of the memorable uh, invites that I've gotten in my life, and, and yours, yours would be different. But the reason why I ask that question, even spend a couple of minutes getting started thinking about that, is the Bible is filled with remarkable invitations from God uh, to each one of us and to people for generations and generations, imploring and begging and even pleading, God pleading with sinners to have a relationship with him. Uh, you can go from Genesis all the way to the, almost the very last book of uh, the Bible, Revelation, in the very last chapter, and you're going to see an invitation from God inviting sinners to have a relationship with uh, with himself. And one of the most wonderful, one of the most beautiful, one of the most life-changing invitations in all of the Bible is coming from none other than Jesus himself, and it's found in Matthew chapter 11, uh, in, at, starting at verse 28. So I'd like to, to read these couple of verses and spend some time under the title, How to Be a Fully Committed Follower of Christ, I, I trust that even if you just came in here because you know of somebody getting baptized or you were looking for a church or, or God poked you this morning, get out of bed and come to church, I, I trust that you could say in your heart at some level, yes, I would love to be a, a follower of Christ. You know, what does that mean? What does that look like? And we're going to just spend a couple of moments as we prepare uh, for the three baptisms uh, here in just a, a little bit. So let me read to you Matthew uh, chapter 11, this life-changing invitation uh, from Jesus himself. It says in verse 28, Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my Burden is light. My yoke is easy and my burden is light. What a beautiful invitation from the lips of Jesus himself. And so, so I want to talk for a couple of moments as we see 
individuals in just a little bit take a step of obedience in publicly proclaiming the Christ who they've already trusted in to talk about, just think about, have us meditate on what does it look like to be a fully committed a follower of Christ. And in Matthew 11, we, we have the very first simple step from Jesus' lips himself. And he says in Matthew 11, in the first three words of verse 28, come to me. And, and so when we talk about being a fully committed follower of Christ, he, he's not saying you start by getting an attendance pin at church. You, you start by getting a trophy from uh, youth group. I was thankful because I never went to youth group. You you don't you 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 don't you start with a relationship with a person, and so so the start of being fully committed follower of Christ is to answer the invitation where Jesus says, "Come to me." Now, if you just look, and we're going to spend a couple of moments just looking at these three verses, Jesus is saying, "Like like just like just come to me." He, he doesn't say in his invitation. Do this, don't do that, do this, don't do that. He, he starts off by saying, you just come to me, like, like just as you are. You, like you come as you are, you, you come to me. And so religion will say, you, you, you got to do, don't do, do. And Jesus and God all through the Bible, you can chase this invitation all through. It's, it's come to me. It's not a matter of doing something. It's coming uh, to a, a person. Now, I shared in the first two services, and in each service, uh, somebody knew this particular group. But, but I, I was uh, studying, meditating, finishing up last night, and the song uh, came to my head from way back in the day. Matter of fact, I was 10 years old when this uh, song was written. The song was written in 1971, and, uh, and I was meditating on the, the invitation is to come. It's not you to do something. It's just to come to a, come to a person. And this is the power of music because literally I have not heard this song in 20 or 30 years or whatever. But the song was written and sung by a group called the Five Man Electric Band. Does anybody here remember the Five Man Electric Band? I know Gary does. No, no, nobody else in here. Well, you, you're probably going to know this song. The song is entitled Signs. And here's what it says. And you'll get the melody even in its, you know, signs, signs everywhere a what? A sign. Help me. Do this. Don't do that. Can't you read the sign? I didn't share with the other two services. The next line, which, which, which I always remembered, long-haired freaky people need not apply. I just kind of like that. <laughs> and so the guy took his hat off and he applied and he didn't get hired. That's why he wrote the song. Sign, signs everywhere, sign. Do this, don't do that. Can't you read the sign? That's religion. Je Jesus isn't into uh, do this, don't do that. He he's come to me. He's not do something for me. He's come to me. What, what a beautiful invitation. Now, just spend a couple of moments looking at these verses. And let's just look at the beauty of this invitation and, and I, just, I just hope that you'll cherish these verses as I have over the years. It's, it's a personal invitation. Jesus says, come to me. Not to a church, not to a denomination. I tell people all the time, when you stand before God, he's not going to ask you which church you went to. He wants to know, did you come to his son, Jesus? Like Jesus has his arms out and he's saying, come to me. In this, and you, you can you maybe find more than I have, but there are at least a dozen personal pronouns in these three verses. Let me just read it, and you think about the personal pronouns. Jesus says, come to me, talking about himself, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. It's, it's, just, it's a personal uh, invitation just to come to the person of Christ and, and believe and trust in his finished work on the cross. A matter of fact, you'll read all through the Gospels and you won't find anywhere where Jesus describes the kind of person he is so, so that you can know when he invites you to come to him, Here's what you're going to find if you take him up on his offer. 
He says, take my yoke upon you and learn, for I am gentle and lowly in heart. It's the only place in Scripture that I know that he really says about what, what, you, what he's personally like from his own words. So personal description of Jesus, of what he's like. So the invitation to come is a personal invitation to be forgiven, to be refreshed, to be renewed, to be rescued, to be given eternal life. It's come to Jesus. And when I think about that for myself, coming to Jesus changed everything in my life. I mean, I am so thankful for my parents who had me in church every Sunday. And church was a have to. And my mom had to remind me often about how it was a have to because it wasn't a want to for me. It was a have to. I, I was made to go to church and I did and I'm thankful that my, my parents didn't give up and I learned about God and, and I was told about Jesus and I found out I was a sinner. But what I missed, I, I don't know how I missed it, but what I missed is that Christ came to die for me personally, and he wanted to take my personal sins, and when he was hung on the cross 2,000 years ago, he actually had, had me in his mind and all of my sins, and, 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 and he, he died for me. Father, forgive him. He doesn't, he doesn't have any idea what he's doing, uh, Father, and so I was highly religious and totally lost, and God brought people into my life and said, Dave, it's not religion. How, how's that doing for you? It wasn't doing very good for me. I felt empty. So I was highly religious and I was totally lost. And I heard the invitation from Jesus to come. The invitation is still there today. So it's a personal invitation. But just if you look at this just for a little bit longer, I want you to see how open and wide and far-reaching this invitation is. Come to me all. All means all. And that's all all means Everyone worldwide who labor and are heavy laden. And that is to be a visual picture of the consequences of life decisions that weigh down on you and consequences of sin that weigh down on you, the consequences of just living life that weigh down on you. And he says, come to me. And if, if, you're, if you're broken down, if you're beaten up, if your sin has gotten you to a place where you just like, like just come to me as a person. So the invitation is as wide as the world. Uh, no caller ID when you call on Jesus. Like, no, like, like he doesn't look like who it is. And then, you know, yesterday I got two robocalls on my phone. Oh, very frustrating when I get one of those. You know, and, and now they've got it down to a science, so it looks like somebody from Polk City calling me, you know, so I'm, I'm a pastor, I'm going to answer the phone. Who, what, what, what do you think they wanted, both of those, both robocalls, what did they want? They wanted to sell me a car warranty on a car I don't even have anymore. That's really frustrating, even for a pastor. But, but Jesus doesn't have caller ID. He doesn't nag, and he won't annoy but what he does is he knocks, and he knocks gently, and sometimes a little bit more firmly, and he says in Revelation 3 and verse 20, and I quote Jesus, behold, I stand at the door and knock, the door of your heart, and if anybody will hear my voice and just open that door of their heart and invite me in, I will come in and we'll have dinner. We'll have a relationship together. And, and so Jesus is saying, look, I'm standing at the door of your life. I, I've, I've come all the way from heaven to earth to right into your life. And I'm knocking on the door of your heart. Can't you get off of the couch and go open up the door and invite me into your life? Like, come to me. It's like you can, you can hear his voice through the door. Like, please, just, just come to me. Like, I died on the cross for you uh, to come to me. Listen to a couple of verses 700 years before Christ, Isaiah 55 and verse 1. Come, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. And he who has no money, come, buy and eat. Come, buy wine and milk without money and without price. And, and then the writer uh, that Jesus is going to quote in just a little bit, why do you spend your money for that which is not bread? And, and why do you labor every day for that which is never going to satisfy you? Incline your ear. This is Isaiah 55, 700 years before Christ said come. Come to me, God said, and hear that your soul may live. So the invitation is just to come. That's where 
being a fully devoted follower of Christ doesn't start with a life of good works. It doesn't start with a life of attendance pins. It doesn't uh, come with a membership to a church. It starts with a personal relationship with Christ. Jesus said in John 7, coming off of Isaiah 55, 700 years later, Jesus would say in John 7, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. And whoever believes in me, as the scriptures have said, out of their heart will flow rivers of living water. Water. So the invitation is as real as the day that Jesus spoke it. It's, it's, it's on paper right here. Jesus is saying, if you don't know me as Savior from your sins, and you're not sure that your sins have been forgiven, then the first step in being my follower is just you just got to come to me and, and invite me into your life. I'll take your sins away. I'll give you eternal life. And just before I leave uh, th- these very sweet and special verses to me, it's not only a personal invitation, and it's not only an open invitation, but it's a very rewarding invitation. It's, it's very rewarding when you come. Notice what he says, come to me. You're weary and, uh, and, and labor and you're heavy laden, and I will give you rest. I mean, just mark that. I'll give you rest. And then he goes on to say, take my yoke upon you and learn from me uh, for, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. So he says, when you initially come to me as a sinner in need of a Savior, I, I will in no wise cast anybody out. I'll accept it. Anyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be, will be forgiven, will be rescued, will be saved. And, and I'll give you rest. Like, I'll just give it to you. you. You don't have to buy it. You don't have to medicate to get it. I, I, will, I will give you rest and, and then as you live with me, as you invite me in, you're going to find a continuing rest no matter what it is, uh, g- what's going on in your life. I will be the peace that passes understanding. And so the word rest, which is used twice in this beautiful invitation, literally means to be refreshed, to be restored, to be renewed, to be revived. It means to be transformed. Second Corinthians 517, if anyone is in Christ, so they've, they've received Christ, they've come to Christ and invited him in. If anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things pass away. Behold, everything becomes new. And that's in the couple of testimonies that you're going to hear. And as we've heard already this morning in the first two services, it's a story of transformed lives and people, just normal people, young and old, who have just come to Christ. And so it begs the question, won't you open your arms to the one whose arms have been opened for you? I mean, when Christ died on the cross, he left us an indelible picture in our minds of these widespread arms inviting you to come to him because he's what he's done on the cross. I, I remember I remember thinking, man, God's up there, and he's holy, and I, I'm, I'm, I'm screwing up all the time, and I'm sinning all the time, and, and, and man, I'm, I'm going to church, and I'm taking communion, and I'm going to the confessional, and, and you know, it doesn't take me a couple hours after the confessional, I'm right back in the sin again, and, and it's like, man, there's, you know, this is just like a, I'm just like a, you know, rat on a, on a term, just going around and around, and I mean, something has to give here, and I remember uh, being quoted 1 Timothy 2.5. For there's one mediator between God and man, and one go-between, and that's the man Christ Jesus. And he invites you into a relationship with him so you can have a relationship with the Father. Won't you open your arms to the one whose arms are opened uh, to you? So, so the first step is, is, is come to me. Now the second step of being a fully uh, committed, devoted follower of Christ is found in the same set of verses right here. And the second step is learn from me. Learn from me. So come to me. That's where it starts. That's where it has to start. And then, and then learn from me or literally learn of me. Look, look back at Matthew uh, chapter 11, verse 28. So he says, come to me. That's where it starts. And it doesn't matter if you're 90 years old or you're five years old. If you realize that you need to come, he died on the cross. I'm a sinner in need of a savior. He says, come, come as you are. 
You, you don't have to do a, a, a list of things first. You just come uh, just right as you are. And then he says, take my yoke and learn from me. And learn for I'm gentle and lowly and you will find rest for your souls. Now the word for learn is the same word in the New Testament for the word disciple. Disciple and learn come from the great, same Greek word. So a disciple is a learner, is a, is a follower. And a learner is a disciple. So here's what Jesus is saying. Come to me and I'll disciple you. That, that's what he learned from me. Learn of me. I'll personally take a vested interest in your life and I will personally, Jesus says, I'll disciple you. I'll, I'll put my spirit in you. And when you read the word, it'll start making sense. Uh, we, we've had testimonies, many up here over the years, of what changed in your life when you received Christ. And one of the things that has changed is the Bible started making sense. It's like I read it and I wanted to read it. It wasn't a have to anymore. And, and I got to read the word. And, and, and that's the spirit of Christ making the Bible uh, come alive. So, he, so he's asking for an opportunity for you to do, do life together. And there's a beautiful word picture right in these three verses. He says, take my yoke upon you. And of course, the yoke is the wooden beam between two oxen. And in that day, they would have a mature, older oxen. And uh, then they would bring an immature, newer oxen. And they would yoke the two together. And the mature one would lead the way and direct the path. And this one, young one over here, would want to kind of wobble, kind of veer off because of that yoke and be attached. The, 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 the line was drawn and the furrow uh, w w was plowed straight. And so Jesus uses this word picture to describe what he wants in our lives. Basically, Jesus is saying, walk with me. Walk with me. Follow me. See who I am. See what I love. I have a personal relationship with me. If you read the and you read the tenor of the verses and the voice and the heart of Jesus coming through, he basically goes, I'll do the heavy lifting in our relationship. Uh, you just come to me. You follow along. You do the following. I'll do the lifting. A, a yoke is never built for, two, for one. It's always for two. It, it would be weird to have a yoke, a yoke on one oxen. You wouldn't, you wouldn't do that. It's, it's always built for two. So it's an invitation to discipleship, to a life with Christ, to doing life, to having your life be the Christ life. That, that's, what he's, that's what he's asking. He doesn't want to just to give a get out of jail free card. He wants, to, he wants to do life with us from the lips of Jesus himself. Now, in Jesus's day, the, the Hebrew rabbis, the Jewish rabbis, had a term that they used to describe disciples and the term that they used, if you were a disciple, you would say, I, I'm one covered in the dust. Uh, that's the word. And so what would happen is a rabbi, a teacher, would get a few disciples. The disciples would leave their home for a couple of years, and they would follow the rabbi wherever he went. He would do life. They would eat meals together, they had breakfast and supper, and they would sleep in the same home, and they would walk in the same places, and, and the disciple would just follow. And they didn't have concrete, and they didn't have asphalt, so they had dirt paths. So a disciple was a follower of a particular rabbi, and the name that they got for themselves is one who is covered in the dust. They followed in the heels of the rabbi. And so a disciple is simply then one that's come to Christ, and now you're, you just say, I just want to follow you. Like, I, I'm all in. Like, like, Lord, help me to stay on the path that you're leading me on. Like, like I want to walk with you, beside you. I want, I want you to, to lead me. Now, it is a call to surrender. Because if you're yoked to Christ, he's not going to go places that, that your sinful nature is one going to go. He, he's going to be stubborn as a mule. And, and so you're going to constantly be rubbing up against. And, and so it is, it is a call to surrender. Now, I think of the 39 years that I've been following Christ. I, I've, been, I've been stubborn as a mule sometimes. And, and I, I buck this way and buck this way. It's never worked. It's never brought joy. The, the, the joyful path is just walking in sync with the Savior, and that's the invitation. He's saying, just come to me and, 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 learn, and learn from me, learn, and really learn from me 
99% of learn from me is learn of me. It's all about knowing Christ and, and who he is and what, what he desires to do in your life. And I can tell you, as the pastor of Lakeside, and my heart, even for those of you I haven't met, it's your first time here, how I long to take each of you by the hand and walk you into the presence of the Savior. Like, like just introduce you to him. And, and you just drop your guard, you drop your religion, you, you drop your list of, of, of good works, you, you, drop, you, 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 lay, you lay your list of sins at his feet, and you say, Lord, here I am, a sinner in need of a Savior, and Jesus says, come. Amen? He just says, come. Why not come? Why wouldn't you come? What reason could you give me to say, no, that, that, that's no good for me? That's, that, 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 that's not going to be of any value to me. There, there's no reason. Well, why wouldn't you say, yes, Lord, I surrender all? Like, if, you, if you'll take me, of course I would love to be your disciple and, 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 and walk with you and, and show me uh, what, what's purpose in life. Why, why, why wouldn't? There's, there's no good. I've never heard of a good reason to not do it. My only regret is having surrendered 39 years ago is that I didn't do it sooner. That, that I, wish I, would have, I wish I would have been yoked to him. I wish I would have come to him and surrendered to him uh, much earlier than I did. So, so come to me and learn from me. And, and then just as we go to baptism, turn to uh, Matthew chapter 28, just a couple of chapters over. And I, I want to give you this third step, and really it leads us right into baptism uh, today. So, so here's the simplest of outlines. And you fill in a lifetime of details. So here's what it means to be a fully devoted devoted follower of Christ. I come to, to Jesus, and I'm saved. I'm forgiven of my sins. And then I have a life of learning of Jesus or learning from Jesus. And then Matthew chapter 28, and this is the marching orders for the church and for every individual. I go for Jesus. Like, like Jesus says, come to me, learn from me, and go for me. Let me read a Matthew 28, uh, known as the Great Commission, starting at verse 18. And Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Like, like, like every knee is going to bow, that's what he's saying. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe or teaching them to obey all that I've commanded. And what a beautiful promise that's contained in these marching orders. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Well, of course Jesus is going to be with you. He's, you're yoked up to him. He's not, going to, he's not going to leave you in the lurch. He's not going to get you halfway down the path and then bail on you. He's, he's a very present help in time of need. Amen? Now, if you just look, even though for my outline it's come to me, learn from me, and go from me, the actual command in this passage of Scripture is make disciples. The actual word go there, where it looks like a command, it's actually not a command. It's assumed to be true. It's assumed that the disciples are walking through life wanting to please Christ with their life. And so Jesus says in these last words, as you're going, make disciples, encourage, uh, persuade. It's what I'm doing right now. It's encouraging and persuading people to come to Christ, to have their sins forgiven, eternal life granted, and then learn from them, be discipled by Jesus, make disciples, and then teach them to observe all that I've commanded. And so that's why we're here for baptism Today, the command is to make disciples. That's what I'm doing right now. The pattern is you see somebody become a disciple. I, I'm sold out because of Christ's finished work on the cross. I want to learn from him. I want to walk with him. I want to live for him, and I want to live with him. And to, to start that relationship, there's a badge. It's like a wedding ring. It, it doesn't get somebody married. It doesn't make them a disciple. It's a sign that they already are a disciple, and that's called baptism. And I could go on and on about this, but if you just look at this passage, the marching orders from Jesus, baptism is not optional. Baptism is not incidental. Baptism is foundational. In the New Testament, everywhere where you see a believer's conversion, you, you follow it with a believer's uh, baptism, and that is always uh, the order, and that's what we're doing here today. Now, I have a picture just to describe, so there's no misunderstanding when these 
uh, three individuals uh, come up here and are baptized about what's going on. The, the, the picture and the mode of baptism is by immersion. That's the only way I see it in Scripture. They always found much water. They went down in the water. They came up out of the water. And Romans 6 says the, 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 the immersion of a believer, we call it believer's baptism. They're not getting their sins uh, forgiven by being baptized. They're already forgiven. They're making it public to you. And so the baptism itself, and when, when Dan gets baptized, the baptism itself is going to do the speaking for him. And it's literally saying in front of you all, the three individuals and the ones that went before, that I'm trusting in the death. That's when they're sitting in the tank. You'll see them. That's Christ on the cross. When they go down under the water, that's a picture of Christ's burial. When they come up out of the water, it's a picture of Christ's resurrection. So the very act of being baptized is the outward symbol of an inward reality that that individual is unashamedly trusting in the death, burial, and resurrection for, of Christ uh, for their life. And it's a great privilege to follow the Lord's mandate as given us in Matthew 28 and other places to make disciples. That is the ministry of Lakeside. And baptizing them. And then having all kinds of ways that we teach them to obey God and follow him with their life. So I'm going to have a word of prayer and uh, then we'll have uh, three baptisms and then we'll close uh, with a song. Father, thank you again. Thank you for each of the three that are going to uh, come up here. Uh, Rachel, young Rachel, and then Dan, and then Janet. And Lord, I pray that you would, I, I thank you for your work in their lives. Young uh, to a little bit older, I, I thank you for what you've done. I thank you for saving them. I thank you that you're in the business of forgiving sins, of inviting people to come to you, a person, for a personal relationship, and that you forgive and you wash and you cleanse and you transform and you renew and you restore and you revive. Thank you for doing that in my life. And I pray, Lord, that you would be honored and glorified uh, through these baptisms here as we conclude our service. In Christ's precious name, amen.